without further ado, I'm going to hand things off to Fleming to kick everything off. So thank you, and welcome to feminism. Putting the papers in the right order is probably good. Yeah. Hi, I'm Fleming, and I'm a feminist. Sometimes people are a little confused as to why I would claim this term, a term that has meant so much to so many in so little terms, a term loaded with meaning and hate and love and aspiration and power and history, history of pain and liberation and hope, which we have all learned. My friends are often curious and ask me, so why do you care so much about feminism? And I was feeling a little bit less than terrible once, and I responded, well, lately I've been trying to be less of a jackass. <laughs> um, maybe that was a little confrontational. Um, but I really can't and never will understand this belief that feminism is alien from manhood, that gender issues are women's issues, and that women's issues don't mean shit to me. I guess there are two reasons for this. The first, based in our most essential values and beliefs. Beliefs we swear to when, at age six, we place our hands on our hearts, and face that flag, and pledge our fealty to a nation of liberty and justice for all. The beliefs with which our founding documents are endowed, the notion that all men are created equal, and the notion that after 200 years we have come to believe applies to our shared humanity, not just every landowning Protestant white person. We are fundamentally drawn to feminism as gospel, as a pathway to freedom, into the world we keep telling people we want. Feminism is essential because it is a movement and philosophy which articulates that which we hold dear. It articulates the fundamental notion that injustice is the concern of all and that women's issues are issues with which everyone should be concerned. The second reason is perhaps um, less lofty, but to me, more meaningful. It's the same reason and the only reason that any cause, any battle has been fought throughout our history is to me, the only thing that has ever mattered. It's people, it's humanity, it's our love for one another. I have and have had friends, family, loved ones, lovers, and others that I care about, who are women, who are beset by the structural inequality of the patriarchal of society, and whose oppression I'm complicit in and I benefit from it. I cannot speak for all men, but I would assume that most have women who they claim to love. And I believe with all of my heart that we cannot truly love the women in our lives if we are not part of any systems which demonize them, subjugate them, limit them, and hurt them. We actually give a shit about the people that we love, and we have to be feminists, because it is through feminism that they might be able to realize their highest qualities and achieve their goals. The world is maybe more complex than I've been able to present. And I think it's worth noting that the developments of feminism apply not only to the liberation of women from oppression, but to all people, men, women, and those who don't identify as either. The constraints of a gender binary that limits our relationships and our lives, the world that attempts to force upon us the notion that to be a man is to be without feeling, to be a woman is to be without strength. And it, it, it's not as if all men everywhere wake up in the morning and are like, let's go reinforce patriarchal oppression. It'll be fun. <laughs> but as the primary beneficiaries of the world in which masculinity is power and femininity gets screwed, and not in the way that most people tend to enjoy it, men have a responsibility to join with those women who have been fighting for generations and lend what aid they can for the purpose of their The panel to my left features five men, different lives, different perspectives, and perhaps
perhaps an understanding of what feminism is or isn't that is alien to the term. But I urge you to hear them as they seek to engage our hearts and our minds in the question of gender on Swami's campus. To pursue a better, more equal view. On behalf of the Women's Center, welcome to Texas. Sense of accomplishment when I look up as a cute guy as you do when you bring home a hot girl. It's been a while. 
giving them time and education. Time and education which need to be followed by determination and hard work from individuals that believe in the <coughs> ideal of equality and counteracting gender-based discrimination. Before coming to Swanee, the word feminism was not a part of my vocabulary. I simply had never come across the word, but there were many instances throughout my life in, w in, my, in my life in which I experienced the fundamentals that form my definition of feminism. Feminism in the Western culture is generations ahead in terms of achieving equality and ending gender discrimination. People around the world view the United States as a place where anyone can go and succeed. Through hard work and de uh, determination, women who live in the third world countries with either unequal gender laws or gender discriminating societal laws view the United States as a place where they can go and succeed in whatever it is they desire. I view gender inequality in the United States compared to the third world countries as incomparable. In, these country, in this country, any woman through hard work can silence any gender discrimination. I think that inequality is not ingrained into the culture of the United States. In America, your work, your actions, and your way of life give you an identity, not your gender. Whereas in some third world countries, it is ingrained into the cultures. For example, no matter your accomplishments, no matter your contributions to society, a woman is still identified as a woman. You can become a doctor, a successful entrepreneur, engineer, <coughs> teacher, but your career is still seen as less significant when compared to a man. 
obviously there, you know, there are exceptions. While writing this, I was talking to a friend, and he insinuated that there are many small groups or businesses in the United States in which men are the majority, and they discriminate against women by not promoting them or giving them fair wages. But there are also exceptions for third world countries. There are many places and groups of people where, who do not discriminate against gender and view women as their equals. Uh, my mom is an example of what I've been talking about. Uh, my father passed away when I was eight years old. Uh, people told my mom that she couldn't raise two kids. She couldn't raise us to be successful. They basically told her to give up on us because we would not amount to anything without a father. My mother was educated, came from a family of, full of educators. Culturally speaking, she and her family were and are on the same page as the West regarding feminism. In college, my mother majored in art, dance, culinary arts, and followed by a master's in education. In addition to her studies, she also won a national championship with her handball team and a few national dance competitions. So hard work was a part of her life. Um, my mom and dad, you know, raised Paran, my little brother, and me to view women as equals. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Even though my parents, their families, and their friends were pretty progressive, educated families, there were only a small there were only a small number in such a big country. So my mom decided to move to the United States because she wasn't going to be limited by societal laws and gender inequality. Since we moved to this country, my mom has worked hard with the determination of raising me and my brother and giving us every opportunity that would have been given to us if our father were alive. While working nonstop, she made sure that we would have every opportunity our peers got. She has been extremely successful in her job. She's been moving up the corporate ladder, and she has not been discriminated against or stopped from promotions because she is a woman. Her hard work, her goodwill, and righteousness have defined her, not her gender. My mom is not the only example of hardworking woman in my family. These women also all live in the United States. I have an aunt who is an orthopedic surgeon. She saved plenty of NBA careers. I have an aunt who is one of the most popular and renowned OBGYNs in her state. I have an aunt who is an amazing educator. She's a principal at one of the top schools in her state, and she believes in education as a form of bringing positive, long-term solutions to problems that we face in everyday society. I have an aunt who's a very successful stay-at-home mom. You know, she's got a crazy dog and two great kids. I have an aunt who loves teaching third graders because, you know, these are the most formative years and she wants to make positive impacts. I have an aunt who's a pretty well-renowned newscaster in the southern U.S. And finally, I have an aunt who in a short 18 years, 20 years, she's been in the U.S. She's built a huge enterprise of collective businesses, condos, apartments, and much more. The women in my family are educated. They had time on their side, and they made their own identities due to their hard work, goodwill, and righteousness. The experiences and great things the women did in my family have had a significant effect on my perspective of feminism. As I mentioned when I started, there are two very visible problems that feminism wants to fix. First, the ideological objective of equal rights for men and women. And second, the objective of counteracting gender-based discrimination in everyday social and cultural practices. I don't think we can fix these problems without giving them time and education. Um, my mom, you know, she loved India. She still loves India. But she agrees with me on time and education. If you look at India 50 years into the future or even 100, my mom would have never moved to the United States. She believes, instead she would stay there because she believes that India will reach where the United States is today in terms of equality. Um, and where the United States will be in the future in terms of equality. My mom's hard work has given her an identity. People judge her personality, her work, and they do not judge her gender. I am the same way. I view everyone in this room as an equal. I did not come across the word feminism until I got to Swanee, but I still believe in the problems that feminism is trying to fix. In the future, with time and an amazing education perpetuating us through us to success through use of hard work, and simply striving to be good people, we will set our own identities. Attached to our identities and our ideal beliefs, these beliefs will be the forefront of change we are hoping for. In time, our success will change laws to achieving equality for both men and women, and will also end gender discrimination. Thank you.
My name is Aaron Browning. I'm a senior here at Sewanee. I am a women's studies minor. To be completely, perfectly honest, I don't know shit about women. <laughs> but what can I say? I mean, come on. Women, right? <laughs> Can you really blame me? You can never tell what they're thinking. You ask if they're okay and they tell you they're fine when they're not actually fine. <laughs> Tricking all us men. Taking our jobs. <laughs> when I was just a young boy, my father would, would tell me, women can't live with them. Anyways, <laughs> like I was saying, I don't know much about women, but, you know, it sure is a good thing I can trust my own assumptions about women, or else I'd have to, you know, actually talk to them and try to understand them on an individual basis. And that's hard. But the thing is, it is hard. Joking aside, it's hard to be vulnerable with other human beings in a place like this, especially when desire is on the line. I see a woman I really like and I shut down. I become a stumbling, mumbling, blathering, awkward mess of a man. I don't know what to do with my hands. I overanalyze everything. I become self-deprecating. I resort to silliness and or deadpan humor. Maybe after some small talk, I'll retreat to an empty corner and recover to seem adequately disinterested. I'll check my phone and start munching on Fritos while trying to seem mysterious. <laughs> you know, mad game tactics. <laughs> we all have our relational failures. We hurt people and we get hurt by people. There's no denying it. Men become frustrated at women. Women become frustrated with men, often with a hatred and resentment that compounds and festers over time, experience after experience. We can develop a sort of hostility toward the other sex if we let people in too frequently. The truth is that sometimes it is easier to blame our relational and sexual shortcomings on reductive notions of male and female than it is to admit to ourselves that the people we hurt, that the people we were hurt by, sometimes incalculably so, are every bit as human as we are. Because that's a terrifying thought. So we dismiss, we reduce, we denounce, we chalk it up to gender. I hear it when I hear a man call a woman a slut, or a bitch, or a whore. I hear it when I hear a woman call a guy a creep behind his back, or tell him that he is or isn't just like all other guys. If we could only be more open and honest, and understand that each and every one of us is driven by a unique combination of physical and emotional longing, one that fluctuates and changes from time to time due to circumstance. <clears throat> Oftentimes, for a variety of reasons, we choose to alleviate one type of longing over the other. <clears throat> Perhaps because maintaining both is an incredible risk. We know. It makes sense here in Sewanee where everyone knows everyone. And breaking up from a relationship with another student can make you feel like you've carved away a significant piece of who you have come to be here. So then there are two options, unfortunately named as they are. We call one the friend zone, and the other called hookup culture. The friend zone, relational investment without sexual fulfillment, and hookup culture, the exact opposite, a pattern of pursuing sexual fulfillment without relational investment. These are the two poles of defense and self-preservation that I've observed during my time here. This is how we single ones choose to deal with our desires. And if it's mutual and consensual and helps us to cope and be true to ourselves and feel a little less lonely and walk on to live another day, I say go for it. Um, I'm going to go off the script and go on a brief tangent here. Um, <laughs> If, if someone says that they 
that they want something, if someone just says that they want something physical, then I think the least you can do is acknowledge that and appreciate that person's honesty. And uh, likewise, if someone just wants to be friends, then I'm sorry, but you got to deal with that. Because um, you don't owe them a damn thing. End of tangent. <laughs> Whoa now, you might, you might say. <laughs> Fanning yourself from how hot and bothered this is all making you. <laughs> how does gender fit into all this? And how is this issue feminist? Okay, first of all, let me say to everyone here that I am proudly, unabashedly, and unapologetically a feminist. And I don't care who knows it. <laughs> or what the hell they want to say about it. You can say it to my face. I dare you. <laughs> But for me, the heart of feminism is recognizing that gender pervades everything. It is recognizing that in a world progressing toward equal human rights, masculinity and femininity are overwhelmingly pertinent issues. I'll give you my take on it, how it affects all of us, and why ignorance is a problem for us all. As a man, I've grown up with a notion perpetuated by both men and women through sitcoms, through culture, through what have you, that all men want is sex. Now that's not entirely true. Men want sex in addition to other things. <laughs> we are not all Neanderthals, thank you very much. Some men don't want sex at all. But you know what? Sometimes, men do want just sex. Just like sometimes women want just sex. So what? As far as I'm concerned, there's no problem just wanting sex if we're open and honest about the fact that we just want sex, or open and honest with the fact that we want anything. You know, sometimes I feel like these implicit expectations are making us into pretenders. If we think we know what men or women want, we'll alter ourselves to what we think they want to see in us. It's an awkward game of I know you know, when in reality, nobody actually knows. I'll add here that some of us don't want any sex at all, whatsoever, case closed, and to those people I say, rock on. <laughs> Do your thing. Don't let anybody tell you what you are or aren't. And I reiterate to everyone, whatever kind of libido funk you got going on presently, I don't judge. Don't. Why must we feel like these things have any say in determining whether we are any less of a man or woman or person? These expectations that we have about gender and sexuality, of what it means to be a man, or what it means to be a woman, can have the effect of perpetuating the very misunderstandings that have us trapped in these patterns of behavior. For every woman who is fed up and over it and just wants to knock boots for a night, there is a man who wants nothing more than to talk to someone and be held, and that should be perfectly okay. Yes, we have our obvious biological differences. Yes, our behaviors have been conditioned by a world that does and always has treated men and women differently. But let's not let the exaggeration of our differences keep us from being empathetic, engaged, eager to understand. So I say to you, the individual, male or female or genderqueer, whatever identification you so choose, you yourself are not all men. You yourself are not all women. You are you. You are you and you are fabulous. <laughs> so when you look upon a fellow student, regard that person with the same sense of respect for their individuality. I like to imagine a Sewanee in which we afford our fellow students the same complexity and human capacity that we see in ourselves. I realize how scary a thought that can be. For all who have experienced violence, sexual violence, discrimination, any other form of hatred, my heart goes out to you. But where do we go from here? I'll be the first to admit that I don't know shit about women. But the first step in knowing anyone is recognizing the inadequacy of one's assumptions. 
I'm no expert on women, or men, or even myself, <coughs> as sad as that is. There are so many things that I don't understand. But as this is a place of learning, we cannot hope to know each other until we free ourselves of our preconceptions, from our anxiety, from our hostility, from our fear of understanding, and simply try to see one another, one human being at a time. Thank you. Yesterday, a good friend inadvertently reminded me who I really am. I almost stood up here today and gave a speech that was very heavily pessimistic, but I'm not doing this because sometimes it takes a friend to remind you what's best, and I'm blessed to have this in my life. <coughs> Let's start off with a short story. This guy's walking down the street when he walk, falls into a hole. The walls are so steep that he can't get out. A doctor passes by, and the guy shouts up, Hey, you, can you help me out? Doctor writes a prescription, throws it in the hole, and moves on. The priest comes along, and the guy shouts up, Father, I'm down in this hole. Can you help me out? The priest writes out a prayer, tosses it in the hole, and moves on. Then a friend walks by. Our guy shouts out, Hey, Joe, it's me. Can you help me out? Joe jumps in the hole. Our guy says, You stupid? <laughs> now we're both down here. But Joe says, Yeah, I've been down here before, though. And I know the way out. Joe. Guy or girl, there are a lot of Joes at Sewanee. And that's what makes this place wonderful. The people who blindly jump in the hole for friends and strangers alike. Knowing innately it's the right thing to do. For me, it's been the Hagee Bradleys, the Doug Copelands, the Dave Myers, the John McGinn's, the Carter Pearsons, the Kaylin Workmans. The list goes on. If it weren't for these people, I know I would not be here today. It's the people who can tell when you need a little cheering on, a big grin, or a little help climbing out of a hole. It's the people that remind you who you really are when you've unknowingly gone astray, or smack you in the head before you make a colossal mistake. For far too much of my Sewanee career, we failed ourselves and our community by not harping on these folks. We've not celebrated the large majority of the student body. We've been distracted focusing on the bad eggs and the bad actions. Those who have gone astray themselves and need a guiding hand, or maybe even a quick, quick swift, swift kick in the butt. <laughs> we spent long, too long preaching, preaching that, no, don't do that, rather than, yes, go out and be exactly like that person. Go emulate that person. Far too often, we let the small bad things in our lives outweigh the large positives. We must take some time now to celebrate the good that is happening here on this campus every single day. We must focus on building up the good rather than dwelling on the bad. We must applaud the unsung heroes who without pause make this campus great with small acts of kindness and awareness every single day. Looking out for a friend or a stranger who's maybe had a little too much fun on a Saturday afternoon, comforting a soul who's down in the dumps, or unconsciously looking out for others. They rarely make the limelight, and their actions don't make it into posters or emails or monologues. We must take the time now to press upon our little brothers, our little sisters, our friends and our peers, that these are the people to emulate. These folks have come before us, and the streets of heaven are far too crowded with these angels. There are our friends, our teachers, our parents, and our grandparents. The streets of heaven are far too crowded with angels, but every time we think we have measured our capacity to meet a challenge, we look up and we're reminded that this capacity may well be limitless. 
These folks are here today, and too soon we will all look up and say, where did they go? How did we let them get away? And regrettably, there's never certainty that these folks will be here tomorrow. We find that this university's destiny is not always that of our own choosing. We do not seek, nor do we provoke, an assault on our freedoms or way of life here. We do not expect, nor do we confront, do, we do not expect, nor we do, do we invite a confrontation with evil. Yet the true measure of Sewanee's strength is not the few bad eggs, it is the angels. Silent but unfaltering in restoring hope and faith in a place that sometimes lets you down and kicks you to the curb. The true measure of Sewanee's strength is not the few bad eggs, but the many Joes who willy, willingly jump into the hole and help, help someone else get out. Jump in to the hole. This is a time for Sewanee heroes. We will do what is hard, we will do what is right, we will achieve what is great. This is a time for Sewanee heroes, and we reach for the stars. God bless the memory of those who came before us. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you. frustrated with an issue that he does not actually care about, and also does not become frustrated with an issue or situation that he does not think could be improved. The truth is, I'm a feminist, and I honestly believe that we need to make improvements to our movement if we're going to continue our progression. Now, I know it's a little strange for a college-age, straight, and single, ladies, <laughs> guy to admit that he's a feminist, but let me tell you my story. See, I grew up in a large family, a mom, dad, an older brother, and three younger sisters. Having three younger sisters has its upside. I knew more about girls by the age of 15 than most men know by the age of 30. But it also has its downsides. You see, I knew more about girls by the age of 15 than most men want to know by the age of 30. For instance, I was first introduced to the idea of what a period was far too early in life as my youngest sister came running out of the bathroom one day with a Kleenex on her nose, screaming, Mom, I'm on my period! To which my mom had to explain, no dear, that's simply a nosebleed. <laughs> now you know a little bit more about my family. <laughs> but what my family has taught me most was that we're all equal. The fact that my brother and I are boys and my sisters are girls made no difference in our degree of equality. Once my sister came home sobbing because some kids at school told her that she couldn't do something because she was a girl. My father replied, you can do anything you put your mind to. You're just as smart and capable as anyone, boy or girl. God loves all his children, and he loves them all equally. That stuck with me, and that's why I'm a feminist. But back to my frustrations. Today, there's a famous misconception that has been perpetuated by both men and women alike in regards to feminism. This common misconception states that feminism is a movement that seeks to place women above their male counterparts. This has been aptly refuted in times past and has continued to be refuted to this day as people begin to realize that feminism is simply an official name for female empowerment. However, there is a more disturbing, mis disturbing misconception that has gained traction in our culture today. This misconception, which ironically has been supported by some women, states that some women do not fit the feminist mold. The women who aren't carbon copies of the feminist leaders who have preceded them are considered to be lesser feminists because of their qualities that are outside the lines of the feminist framework. Differences they possess, whether tattoos, odd piercings, or other quote-unquote strange activities, lead them to feel ostracized by the feminist community instead of feeling embraced. Feminism outwardly preaches equality, but is guilty of internally practicing a fierce hierarchy. This leads these individuals to ask the heartbreaking question, is there any room here for me? Not everyone fits the mold, but is that not what feminism is about? Providing a place for those who challenge the preconceptions of what a woman should be. To me, the feminist movement's true definition and its greatest strength is that in its purest form it is synonymous with the word family. So you don't choose your family any more than you choose your gender or your economic situation or your natural appearance. But the beautiful thing about a family is none of that matters. A family moves together uh, towards a common goal unified by the understanding that no single member holds all the pieces of the puzzle. 
but each member holds a piece that is crucial to the puzzle's completion. The family knows that we all lack something, but our individual strengths are used to cover another's weaknesses, just as their strengths will be used to cover ours. Those outsiders who are turning away have the potential to be our greatest advocates. No, they don't. They, I know they might not look the same as we look or sound the same as we sound, but we don't need them to. We don't need clones, people who just do what has always been done. We need individuals, people who will take the torch and progress farther than we have gone now. A trail has been blazed by our predecessors, women and men alike, to gain the equality that every person deserves. Somewhere along the way, we got sidetracked. We began to let our insecurities about ourselves dictate how we treat other people. We began to attempt to define what female perfection is and use this definition as a weapon, protecting the so the quote unquote perfect and waging war on the on those who we thought were imperfect. We began to cut each other down instead of building each other up. But now is the time to remember from whence we came. Now is the time to refocus on what our main goal is. Now is the time to come together. Because of the words of Coach Tony DeAmazzo from the movie Any Given Sunday, either we heal now as a team, or we will die as individuals. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm frustrated with feminism because I know we aren't living up to our potential. But I'm hopeful and incredibly optimistic about what the future holds for us because we're moving together in the right direction. The feminist family, the feminist family I know and love, my family, is a family that has the power to love like God loves, loving everyone and everyone equally. Um, and let's hear it again for these awesome speakers.